Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on redox. This is for the developing metals topic for OCRB salters. So this video is dedicated to um, the uh, salters specification and everything in here you'll see is dedicated for this topic. This video is one of two videos um, for um, uh, for the developing metals topic. So I've split it up into two just to make it a little bit more manageable. Um, I've also done, um, on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel, there's a full range, not just this video, but there's a full range of year one and year two A-level chemistry videos of this type. So these are the revision videos. But there's also some whiteboard tutorials as well where I talk through uh, specific points in chemistry. Now, they're all there's a very comprehensive range, a full range of information there. So it's not generic. It's not like other resources where you may think, you know, is, does it apply to me or does it not? This one is actually dedicated to you. Um, all for free all i ask is you hit the subscribe button that would be absolutely fantastic you'll get all the updates um, and as long as people keep subscribing and liking and watching the videos then i will keep making them and i'll update them when new specifications come out etc so they're all there and um, these this video as well this is a revision video the ones with the black screens are revision videos and um, these are really useful um for um uh, for revision purposes so you can actually purchase these slides here so i've made them as slides so you can actually purchase them by clicking the link in the description box below. The great value for money, you can um, take them on, use them on your smartphone or on your tablet, use them on the move. And I've known people print these off as well, actually, and use it as part of their revision notes um, to put them into their file for each topic. So um, they're all available there. Great value for money. Just click on the link below and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Okay, so like I say, this is dedicated to the Salter's specification, okay, and it meets these specification points here. So in this video, we're going to be looking at redox, as it suggests in the title. So we're going to be looking at um, redox reactions, half cells, so electrochemical cells we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're going to be looking at the feasibility of reactions, um, and also just towards the start, um, we're going to be looking at um, titrations as well. So a quick review on acid-base titrations, just to kind of refresh your mind of what they are. But also, um, we're going to be looking at redox titrations um, as well. Uh, and then finally, we're then going to look at uh, feasibility of electrochemical cells um, too. So this is what we're going to be looking at. So the first thing I think we should start by looking at is um, reduction and oxidation, seeing as though this topic is all about redox. Um, and obviously, because it falls in the developing metals topic, it's going to be um, there's going to be quite an emphasis on the metal side as well, um, as you'll see um, as you'll see all the way through the video. Okay, so reduction and oxidation. So you might have seen some of this um, in year one chemistry, but as a reminder, we're going to kind of develop this a little bit more in year two. So um, electrons are transferred when reduction and oxidation takes place. Okay, and we use the acronym OIL rig. Okay, to help understand what's happening. An oil rig stands for oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. So this is oil rig. Okay. This reaction, as you can see here as an example, um, is when calcium um, is completely burnt in oxygen. It involves reduction and oxidation. So we say this is a, a redox reaction, as you can see. So we've got calcium, um, complete combustion of calcium. And that forms calcium oxide so this is definitely a, a redox reaction and we're going to split this up into reduction and oxidizing okay so the, and oxidation should I say so first one this reaction and um, with calcium first calcium has actually been oxidized as it's losing electrons so you can see here the calcium is going from zero if you know your oxidation states and um, so you would have come across them in year one so this has an oxidation state of zero this has an oxidation state of plus two because it's calcium two plus so you can see here this is definitely oxidation okay and two electrons are being produced so that means it's losing electrons um, and this is reduction. So oxygen is being reduced. So you can see oxygen is picking up two electrons. So oxidation, um, um, so the oxygen is picking up two electrons to form O2 minus. So this is um, this is a reduction because you're going from zero. This is the oxidation state. Remember, oxidation state of an element is zero, and that's going to two minus so O2 minus there. So that's a reduction process. It's gaining electrons because it's a reduction process. So reduction is gain of electrons. Okay, and that's certainly what it's doing there. So these are your half equations. Okay, 
Okay, so reducing agents. Now, this is really, really important because we're going to be using, when we look at electrochemical cells in particular, we're going to be using the words reducing agent, oxidizing agent, and reduction and oxidation. You can't get confused between oxidation and oxidizing agent. Okay, they're two different things. So oxidation is describing a process, and oxidizing agent is actually a chemical that's allowing that process to happen. Okay. So in this case, a, an easy way to, well, kind of an easy way, because I suppose it can get quite confusing with this, but to try and make it not confusing, because you can't, can't afford to get confused with these two, is you know the acronym oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So we know that's oil rig. Re, a reducing agent does the opposite. So reduction is gain, but a reducing agent would lose electrons. Okay, so it does the opposite of what the actual action is. So reduction is the gain of electrons, but a reducing agent... Um, loses electrons okay because they're oxidized themselves so that's really important and then we've got oxidizing agents these gain electrons and are themselves reduced so again do it the opposite so oxidation is loss of electrons so an oxidizing agent would gain electrons okay it's just the opposite try not just remember that acronym there as a start okay and then um, whatever the agents are is just the opposite of what this acronym states okay so effectively that's on a, on a simple way that's just a way of remembering it but in reality the oxidizing agents gain electrons so these are allowing reduction to happen okay so in this case oxygen here is your oxidizing agent so these are gaining the electrons and they are themselves reduced okay in that in that same form so don't get them don't get them mixed up at all because you are going to see this. We're going to go into this in a lot of detail um, later on in the video. And um, so as long as you got that bit that bit first, then it makes it a little bit easier later on. Okay. Right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use these principles of reduction and oxidation and these half equations, and we're going to try and combine these two sides of an equation. Okay. So the two parts of an equation: the reduction side, the reduction part, and the oxidation part. And we're going to combine them to form an overall equation. And this is a really important skill that you need to be able to do, okay? So half equations, like we've seen before, they show reduction and oxidation, and it shows it in two equations because we've got a reduction part and an oxidation part. Now, all half equations have electrons in. That's how you can spot if it's a half equation. They must have electrons in. Ionic equations do not have electrons in, okay? So that's really, really important. So if the exam board are asking you, or the examiners are asking you, um, to write a half equation, you must have electrons in there. Okay, there must be electrons. If they're writing for an ionic equation, you shouldn't have electrons in there. Okay, so let's have a look at the rules about how we can balance half equations. So the first rule, rule number one, is you write down the species before and after a reaction. So you will be given a reaction in the exam, and you're just writing the species what we start with and what do we have at the end. Okay. The second rule is balance any atoms apart from oxygen and hydrogen because we'll deal with these later. Rule number three is balance any oxygens with water. Rule number four is balance any hydrogens with H plus ions. And then finally, balance any charges with electrons. Okay. Now, you might not be required to do steps three and four. That's why there's an asterisk near them. Um, so this will only be done if there is indeed oxygens and hydrogens to balance. If there isn't any in your half equation, then we just miss that step, step three and four out. Now, you might have a different method of doing this. There's no one method of doing it. I'm going to go through a method which I think is, is quite universal um, and, can, can, well, yeah, and can cater for as many different possibilities um, as we can because sometimes you can come up with a method that works for some examples but not for all. So I believe that this one kind of covers, um, covers all bases that you need for, for A-level chemistry. Okay, So this is the method that I go through. You might have a different method. As long as you come out with the same answer, it doesn't really matter. Um, we're just looking for um, a method in which we can work these out, okay? So, write a half equation. Let's look at an example. Write a half equation showing the conversion of iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus, okay? So, we're going to go through these rules and try and match them up. So, first of all, we need to write down our species before and after the reaction. So, before it's Fe2 plus and afterwards it's Fe3 plus. So, that's pretty straightforward, okay? So, we've got that. Then we need to balance any atoms apart from oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, so you can see here that we've got Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. We've got one Fe either side, so they are already balanced. We don't need to do anything with that. Okay, we then need to balance any oxygens with water. We don't have any oxygens, so 
that's fine, we just keep it as it is. And then we balance any hydrogens with H plus ions. We don't have any hydrogens, so we just keep that the same. So this is fairly straightforward, isn't it? And then the last one is we balance charges with electrons. So um, you can see here that we've got a 2 plus on the left, we've got a 3 plus on the right. So our electron must go on the right-hand side to effectively bring the right-hand side down to 2 plus to make them balance. So there it is. So this process is oxidation. And we know it's oxidation because we're going from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. The oxidation number is increasing from 2 plus to 3 plus. So that is oxidation. Remember, oxidation number increasing means oxidation. Um, oxidation number decreasing, that means reduction. Okay. Um, also, another sign that this is oxidation is that uh, oxidation is the loss of electrons. And you can see Fe2 plus has lost an electron to produce Fe3 plus. So there's two, there's two ways in which we can kind of certify that. So we need an oxidizing agent to allow this to happen. So this can't just happen on its own. You can't just get Fe2 plus and it just turns into Fe3 plus. We need another reagent, i.e. an oxidizing agent, to allow this to happen. Okay, so this is why you always have two halves. So let's have a look. We're going to use the same rules, but we're going to look at a half equation showing the conversion of MnO4 minus to Mn2 plus. Okay, so MnO4 minus... Okay, producing Mn2+. Plus. So you can see here that we've got um, our manganate, which is um, our start chemical, and Mn2 plus is our product. So that's what we've done there. So that's fine. Okay. Then what we have to do is balance any atoms apart from oxygen and hydrogen. Okay. So you can see here that actually we have one Mn here. Ignore the oxygens. And we have one Mn here. So in that step, it's already balanced. We don't need to do anything else. Okay. Then we need to balance any oxygens with water. Now, you can see here that we have four oxygens on the left, but we don't have any on the right. So we're going to add water, and so that water means we're going to have to add four H2Os to make sure that we've got the same number of oxygens. So we're going to add water onto the right-hand side. Okay, so now the fourth step is we need to balance any hydrogens with H plus ions. So you can see here that we've got eight hydrogens on the right-hand side, and we have nothing on the left. So we need to add eight hydrogens, H plus ions, to the left-hand side. So let's have a look. There it is there, okay? So you can see we're starting to build a half equation. You don't need to remember these. I know they look really scary because there's loads of big numbers in there, but it's a case of knowing the method to write your half equation down, okay? And the final thing is we need to balance charges with electrons. So looking at the number of charges on the left, we have eight positives and one negative, so that's a seven plus on the left. And on the right, we have a two plus on the right. So we need to add electrons to this side to equal that. We need two plus on here and two plus on this side. So we're adding electrons, because remember electron is a negative charge, so we need to add another negative charge. We need to add more negatives to this side of the equation to make it equal the overall plus two on the right hand side and so the number of electrons we need to add are five electrons on the left hand side and so there we have our equation that is now balanced that's our half equation so this is showing a reduction process okay so you can see here that it's um, definitely re uh, reduction because we've got reduction is the gain of electrons so electrons are being gained so electrons on the left hand side is showing a reduction process as you can see so your manganese is being reduced from MnO4- to Mn2+, plus. so that's definitely a reduction process. So you can see, it's quite a clever way, quite a neat way of actually developing what is, quite uh, on the face of it, quite a complicated equation. So following this method allows you to write these half equations um, down. Okay, so these two half equations, we can combine these to make a full ionic equation, and that's what we're going to look at now, because this was the key thing, was writing half equations, that's fine, we've got one showing reduction, one showing oxidation, but we need to write an overall ionic equation showing the two processes working in harmony. So, we're now going to combine these half equations together. So two half equations can be combined to make a full ionic equation. Um, we've just got to make sure our electrons balance. Now the mathematicians in you um, will know this method quite well. This is, um, or even if you don't do maths, if you're looking back to GCSE and you might remember simultaneous equations, um, this is basically the same method. Um, you know, we're balancing two equations and we're going to combine it to form one so um, the mathematicians will spot this method quite well so you see there is a use for simultaneous equations um, so 
this shows oxidation. That was our first step, was iron 2 plus going to iron 3 plus plus an electron. Okay, And our reduction step was that one there. So we're reacting these two chemicals together and um, we're producing, um, obviously, new products. So the key thing here, um, in like simultaneous equations where you can kind of pick which... Um, which subject you want to balance with chemistry with these equations you don't have a choice you've just got to make sure your electrons balance in both the top equation and the bottom equation so you can see here that we've got five on the bottom and only one on the top so what we need to do to make this top this top line balance for this one in terms of the number of electrons then we multiply everything in this top equation by five okay so we have five fe2 plus five fe3 plus five electrons because that means that we have the same number of electrons in each equation so we're going to write it down there okay so there's our new equation which is written down there then what we can do now we've got the same number of electrons we can then cancel them out so there we are okay so we can get rid of them and then all we do is we literally just combine the two equations so whatever's on the left hand side of both equations goes on one side and whatever's on the right hand side of both equations goes on the other so let's have a look there it is there okay very important this is a, a full ionic equation you should have no electrons in an ionic equation at all okay so they should be cancelled out so that's what's left there now you can see that this equation here shows reduction and oxidation okay so we're showing both steps happening in this equation so this is the overall one and um, there may be a case as well depending on what you've got there may be other species in here that are on the same left and right okay so you for example you might have h pluses on the left um, and in some equations you might have um you know you might have some h pluses on the right depending on how you've done it of course it's it's not likely but um you might have some species on the left and right um particularly if you're looking at ionic compounds and split them into ions so what you'd have to do is just make sure that all species cancel so make sure you've got it to the lowest the lowest form at all most of the time though you're just going to get something you know fairly straightforward like this so just make sure that everything balances okay it should do by default you don't need to worry about you know balancing equations can take time sometimes but this one's fairly straightforward <coughs> okay excuse me um right so we're now going to look at acid uh, we're now going to look at some titrations okay because it wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't look at redox reactions or anything like this without titrations but just as a bit of a, a taster what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you um a one that you've already seen already which are acid base titrations um now titrations are really useful in chemistry because they're used to work out the concentration of an acid or an alkali okay so they're really useful for that so this is just showing you kind of on a on a kind of um, a basic level how titrations work and then what you really do need to know for this topic in particular are, are redox titrations so i'm going to introduce you to a titration in general this is an acid base one and then we'll look at the redox titrations afterwards so remember um with these types of titrations you have an acid or an alkali in a burette with a known concentration you have that in your burette at the top and in your conical flask you have an acid or an alkali with an unknown concentration, but you have a known volume in that conical flask. Okay, and then what we're going to do is add a few drops of indicator in there as well. We'll look at the indicators later. Okay, so as the chemical in the burette, so what we're going to do is add the chemical in the burette into the conical flask. Now, one of the key skills with doing a titration is we add this. Um, we do like a, you could do a rough titration first you do a rough one first to get a rough idea where the end point can be in the end point you'll see a color change in this conical flask but what you have to do is you have to add it drop wise really close to the end because one drop can make a big difference to the end point so once you get near the end point you slow it down a bit and you add it drop by drop and you swill the flask around to make sure you're getting that distributed evenly within your flask Okay, so we're adding this slowly, and basically, when the end point arrives, we're then going to measure the amount that we've added into our burette. But there's also a skill in measuring it. You've got to be careful because you've got to measure at the bottom of the meniscus. So the chemical that you're using will have this kind of semicircular meniscus at the top here, and you always read from the bottom, not from the top. So you can see here, there's your burette. We've zoomed in on one bit there. So the value on this one is going to be 20 not 19.8 okay so that's 20 centimeters cubed um at the at the top there okay 
Right, so then we've got to record your results to two decimal places. Another key thing that you've got to do, you must record it to two decimal places. Um, and you can only record or you can only take results which are concordant. So these results must be within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. It's no point in taking a measurement of 20 centimeters cubed and then 21 and then 25 because they're not concordant, they're miles away from each other. We don't know which value is the true value. Okay, so we've got to keep going until we get at least two that are concordant with each other. Once you've got some concordant results, you can have confidence in them results being accurate, and then we can use them numbers to then work out um, uh, work out the well, do some calculations, which we'll look at later. But the key thing here is the practical skill. Okay, it's about being able to know, you know, what is concordant. It must be within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other, and the recordings, the number you record must be to two decimal places. You can't just write 20. And even if it's 20, bang on 20, you've got to put 20.00. Make sure you're showing the examiners you know exactly what level, you know, to what, what degree of precision you can actually read this to. And it is to two decimal places. So you must give it to two decimal places. Very, very important. Okay. Right. So indicators that you can use in this, now this is in acid-base titrations, you'll see that um, sometimes with your redox titrations, which we'll look at next, um, your redox titrations, you don't actually need to use an indicator because some of the chemicals we use are colored already, and so therefore they are self-indicating. But if they're not, and they're colorless, then we have to add an indicator in to help us determine you know, what's happening. So phenolphthalein is one with an acid-base titration, it's colorless in acid, and it turns pink when we add an alkali. Clearly, if it's the other way around, then you get a different color change. Depends what you're adding to it. And methyl orange is another one. So it's red in acid and yellow in alkali. Okay. Uh, right. Very important. So make sure you're able to really this 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 is a reminder. You do need to know about acid-base titrations, but it's not specifically um, required in the development metals topic. I've put this in because it's just a reminder of what a titration is and depending on the order that you've done it in you might not have looked at this yet in year two but um, it gives you an idea of what a titration is and just a reminder a bit of a refresher of how you actually conduct a titration and the practical technique that you need because they are so important in chemistry okay so we're going to look at now redox titrations so these titrations are the ones which are more akin, which you definitely need to know for this topic. You won't have seen redox titrations before, so this will be the first time that you've done them. But the method is the same. It's just we're dealing with different a different um, uh, chemical, different different chemicals and different reactions. We're dealing with redox reactions instead of neutralization reactions. So a redox reaction um, is basically what we've seen before, but we're going to run a titration to do it. So titrations can be used to work out the concentration of a reducing or an oxidizing agent, depending on what we're working out. And so in this example, we're going to be um, finding the concentration of the reaction that we've seen already. So that's MnO4 minus, and by, by titrating this against a reducing agent like iron two plus, okay? So we're going to be looking at, obviously in this example, we're gonna look at the concentration of a reducing agent. You can do it for an oxidizing agent as well. We just reverse it. In other words, we put our, um, um, instead of having in here we have our reducing agent so we've got fe2 plus instead you can have fe2 plus in here and mno4 in here so you can do it the other way around it doesn't really matter the end point is going to be slightly different um you know but you're still going to uh, the end point in terms of the color change is going to be back to front as well but it doesn't really matter which order you do it in anyway so in this example here like i say we're going to put our reducing agent in the bottom here so our reducing agent is something like iron 2 plus there's an unknown concentration so that's what we want to work out we don't know what that is but we do know the volume that we've added in because we can measure it in here now normally the volume is probably going to be around about um 25 centimeters cubed that's normally the standard amount but it can be 50 it can be any amount but normally it's 25 and use a pipette and with a um, pipette filler on the top to measure the the amount um precisely Okay, so then what we're going to do um, is we're going to add dilute sulfuric acid into this particular solution, um, and this is to ensure we have sufficient H plus ions to allow this to allow the reduction of the oxidizing agent. Okay, so we add H plus into that there. This you know this might be different depending on the titration that you've done, but for this typical one with the transition metal, for example, like this, and using manganate, we'll have to add acid to it to allow it to go. Okay. 
This is a common redox titration. You might have seen this. You might have done this already. If you if you're looking at this in terms of revision, then um, you might have seen that already. If you're not and you're looking at this from afresh, then um, uh, then what I would encourage you to do is to go and have a look online, go on YouTube or something, and you can see the colours of these, and you can see this titration occurring. Okay, so we have an oxidizing agent in our burette, and it has a known concentration. So, for example, it's going to be manganate ions, so MnO4 minus that goes in there. And then what we're going to do, just like with our acid base titration, is we're going to add the manganate ions into the burette, uh, in the burette, into the conical flask until we see, in this case, the faint color of manganate, your uh, MnO4 minus, appear. Okay, and this is known as the end point. So this is going to be a nice deep purple color in here okay and this one um is going to be um uh, this one's going to be colorless down here okay well it's gonna be slightly colorless. it's gonna be um like a um like a pale uh, like greeny color but it's almost going to be colorless anyway you'll notice the difference it depends on the concentration of course <coughs> excuse me right so what you're gonna do is you're gonna add this manganate in here and eventually what you're gonna see is it, you get a splash of color here and then when you mix it it'll disappear and then you get a splash of color and then you mix it and it'll disappear and eventually this the color change or the color disappearing will become increasingly more stubborn to disappear that's just because your concentration of your manganate is increasing over time in this flask so the amount in there is increasing so when you get close to that point we add it drop by drop and eventually doesn't matter how much you shake this flask the color won't disappear and that would be your end point okay so we very important we had it drop by drop so like i say the sharp color change is a very, very distinct um, at time when, or very certain time when this endpoint is actually being met. So your manganate ions form aqueous potassium permanganate solution, and these are purple. Okay, so it's this deep purple color, like I say. So they immediately react with the reducing agent until all of that reducing agent is used up. So in other words, there's a fixed amount of Fe2 plus in here. Once all the manganate has reacted with it, there'll come a point where you've got an excess of manganate ions so there's say there's a hundred of these to keep it simple there's a hundred fe2 plus ions in there and you've got let's say you've got a thousand manganate ions in here so you keep adding and keep adding and effectively they'll react so once you reach a hundred then they've all reacted and then once you reach 101 so you add the the um you know the 101 uh manganate ion then effectively you've got an excess haven't you um, and then this will go purple and that is your end point Okay, so that's what we're saying. Okay, so one drop at the end point can turn that solution purple. That's the color of the oxidizing agent. And you could use a colorless oxidizing agent and a colored reducing agent, like I say, and we're looking out for color disappearing in this case. So in other words, if we had our manganate in there and our iron, iron 2 plus in here, then effectively we're looking for this to disappear, the color, the purple color to disappear. It doesn't matter. The end point is where you see a color change. Okay, so you read how much oxidizing agent was added. Remember, we read the bottom of the meniscus and always read at eye level. Okay, you've got to get right down to eye level to, to read it properly. And then we're going to record your results to two decimal places, just like we've seen before. And we repeat until we get two results that are concordant. So they must be within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other. Okay, so that's the practical side of it. What you've then got to do is obviously once we've got the number, you've then got to be able to do a calculation. So that is exactly what we're going to be doing. So we're going to use that redox titration to work out the concentration of a reagent. Okay, so here's an example here. So we've got 18.3 centimeters cubed of 0 0.0250 moles per decimeters cubed of potassium manganate, so KMnO4. And this reacted with 25 centimeters cubed of acidified iron 2 sulfate solution. And here we've got to calculate the concentration of Fe2 plus ions. So the first one is we write out the equation and we balance it. So that's the first step. So this was the, remember we, we came up with the two half equations and we've written down the full ionic equation. Okay, so that's what we've got there. That's the full ionic equation. So we make sure that's balanced and it should already be balanced if you have derived this from your two half equations so practical terms you've got your potassium manganate in your burette and we have our acidified iron sulfate solution this is going to provide us with our fe2 plus ions that's going to be in this solution here in our conical flask okay so that's the mechanics of it so then once we've done that um what we have to do just like with 
like we've seen with acid base titrations um, is we have to calculate the number of moles of something so in this case we're going to be calculating the number of moles of manganate ions now we can do this because we have all the data that we need to calculate this so the moles equals concentration that's moles per decimeters cubed times volume decimeters cubed always decimeters cubed moles equals 0 0.0250 okay so this is the number of uh, sorry this is the concentration um, of your potassium manganate so that's what we've added there multiplied by the volume now we added 18.3 centimeters cubed of this but notice I've put times by 10 uh, times by 10 to the minus 3 because I want to convert that centimeters cubed into decimeters cubed so effectively I need to divide that by a thousand now if you see me other videos you'll know that I'll always just put times 10 to the minus 3 because that means the same as divide by a thousand okay so just to the they go just a side note there you must convert to decimeters cubed first you can't just keep it as centimeters cubed okay and the number of moles is 4.58 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles of your manganate so that's the number of moles in here so that's good because now we know the number of moles and we also know the volume of it and i use a saying and you probably if you see me other videos you'll you'll hear the same um um, a lot but if in doubt work out the moles because if you've got the moles of something you can work out a lot of other things from the moles so work out the moles of anything of something if you're ever in doubt okay right so use the equation to find out the molar uh, sorry use the equation to find out molar ratio in order to work out the number of moles of fe2 plus so we know the number of moles of mno4 minus but we need to work out the number of moles of this Okay, so there's a 1 to 5 ratio, as you can see there. So the number of moles of Fe2 plus is going to be 4.58 times by 10 to the minus 4. Multiply that by 5. Okay, and so that's going to get us the number of moles of Fe2 plus, which is 2.29 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles. Okay, now once we have the number of moles of iron, we need to work out the concentration. So we use that equation again, as what we've said before. So concentration, we just... Um, uh, rearrange it but concentration is the number of moles divided by the volume must be in decimeters cubed remember so the concentration is 2.29 uh, uh, times by 10 to the minus 3 that's the number of moles we've just worked out there divided by 25 because remember we had 25 centimeters cubed of that in there that's how much we had again times by 10 to the minus 3 to convert it into decimeters cubed and that gets us a concentration of 0 0.092 moles per decimeters cubed Okay, so fairly straightforward, very standard type of calculation, titration calculations. There may be other bits added to it. So, for example, they might get you to work out um, the um, equation first. So you might have to do two half equations, then develop into a full ionic, and then they'll probably roll into the calculation, as you can see here. So they might get you to do things like that. Um, you know, it just depends on, on what questions are asking, of course. But the principle is still the same. Okay, so... So we've looked at um, redox, we know what reduction is, we know what oxidation is, and we know what um, how to write a full ionic equation, and so we know what a reducing agent and an oxidizing agent is, and we also know about titration calculations as well. So we've kind of built up a really good foundation to move on to our next part, which is electrochemical cells. And in fact, we're going to start with something called a half cell. Now, um, a half cell is basically one half of an electrochemical cell and cells are used to make batteries as well so this is about electricity now this is the kind of really clever bit we're using chemistry to generate electricity okay this is this bit it's really good so um a half cell anyway is one half from electrochemical cell and they can be constructed of a metal dipped to into, into its ions or a platinum electrode with two aqueous ions so this is a bit weird because actually what we're going to do is literally just take a beaker with let's say iron 2 plus ions in there and we're going to put a bit of iron in there just a big chunk of iron in the beaker and we actually have a reaction okay we have a reaction that's happening um so let's have a look what a half cell is first how it looks now if you've seen these you'll be familiar with the setup of these um but if you haven't then the diagram here kind of shows you what what this looks like so basically we have a beaker and in this beaker you can see that we have an iron um, solution here so we've got fe2 plus or fe3 plus it doesn't really matter we've got this in the beaker here and then dipped into that beaker we've got a bit of iron metal so it's the solid version obviously so fe which is stuck into the beaker there 
Now if we had an iron electrode like say dipped into this solution, we actually have a reaction that's happening here. Um, so the reaction is, in this case if it's Fe2 plus in here, this would be Fe2 plus picking up two electrons to form iron and vice versa. Okay, it's a reversible reaction. So there's actually a little reaction happening here. Electrons have been accepted or given up depending on which way around the reaction is happening. So there's actually um, a small reaction happening at the end there. So that's fine. But you can also have this set up as well as a half cell. So basically this is where we have no metal um, uh, we have no metal alternative. So for example we might have in this beaker here iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus and the equilibrium between them two. So we've got that happening in the beaker but clearly none of them are solids. So um, we must use because we've got both ions in there we've got to use an alternative electrode so the electrode is going to be in this case it's going to be a platinum electrode is is commonly used for this and the reason why a platinum electrode is used and um, you'll see where this links in later because these electrodes will then be connected together to form a cell but platinum electrode used is because it's inert it's not going to interfere with the reactions with this reaction which is fe3 plus form an fe2 plus and vice versa um, and also it's a good electrical con uh, uh, good good um, uh, electrical conductivity so when we connect these cells together we can actually allow electrons to flow through them so um, this is fine and this is a um, shown as a, an alternative half cell where we have two ions reacting and we need platinum electrode to help um, electrons flow so an electrochemical cell is effectively created, like I say, by joining two different half cells together. So for example, it could be um, these two half cells could be connected together. So you've got one beaker and one beaker and we connect it with a wire with a voltmeter in there. But we'll we'll look at that um, now, basically, how that how that cell can be made. Okay, so make sure you know the method for setting up an electrochemical cell. Okay, Salters are wanting you to know how you actually set this up and what things you need to make this cell. Okay, so we've got a diagram here of our cell. There's our electrochemical cell there. Okay, so it looks a little bit like this, but we're going to break it down and show you how this can actually be made. So step one, obtain the metals under investigation and clean them with sandpaper or emery paper to ensure surface impurities are removed. So we've got our metal bits of metal here, and we're going to scrub them with sandpaper. So that ensures that we have no um, impurities impurities could be something like oxide you might have a slight oxide layer on the top of the metal and you don't want that you just want the pure metal exposed step two some of the metals have grease on the surface as well so for example we're touching them with our hands we've got oils on our hand that can then get onto the surface of the metal so what we're going to do is wash the surface with propanone um, and then from then on once we've washed the surface we then um, must wear gloves to, put a, to prevent any further contamination because you're going to be handling this metal um, again okay so then step three is we place each metal into a solution containing the iron of the same metal. So for example, in a, a copper electrode, that would be dipped into a beaker of copper sulfate. And so copper sulfate would produce copper 2 plus ions, so it's Cu2 plus ions. So you would dip that into there. Okay. Um, if you are using an oxidizing agent containing oxygen, you'll need to add acid 2. So for example, if you've got MnO4 minus, um, then we need to add um, acid in there as well. So we need to acidify the solution. So we've seen that before already with the uh, titration that we looked at between um, iron 2 plus and demanganate ions. Okay, and step four. Um, step four is um, we make the salt bridge from filter paper soaked in saturated potassium nitrate. It literally is, or potassium chloride. Um, it literally is saturated. You just take a bit of... Um, filter paper you roll it up into a into a strip like that and you dip it into a solution that is incredibly saturated and then you drape that across the two beakers here so you've got one beaker there and you've got one beaker there okay so each one it must be submerged in the solutions there but this salt bridge must not be touching the electrodes themselves so it must be draped between the two beakers there very important okay and the last step, so step five, is then we connect the electrodes with wires. We use crocodile clips for that. 
and then we place a voltmeter in between um, and the voltmeter um, should show a reading if the, all this is set up correctly then we should see a number that appears in that voltmeter there so this is your cell this is your full electrochemical cell two half cells and a full cell there okay so we're going to look in a little bit more into these electrochemical cells and like I say these cells are made up of two half cells and they're joined by that wire that voltmeter and the salt bridge okay as we would seen before. So when we connect these two half cells together we get one side undergoing a reduction process and the other undergoing an oxidation process essentially what we have here is a redox reaction now we've seen redox reactions we've seen them before this is a bit of a different setup that's fine we've got a beaker and we've got electrodes we've got a voltmeter and salt bridge it looks a bit complicated but we still have just imagine it as just a redox reaction that's all we have we've got one half cell being reduced and one half cell being oxidized okay the voltmeter is used to measure the voltage. Now, your physicists are probably screaming at us now. Um, it's, I know it's not voltage, it's potential difference, okay? Um, but we're measuring the potential difference in volts um, between um, zinc and copper, okay? So we call this EMF or E-cell, okay? So that's what it's called. So the value here is E-cell, okay? or EMF is also known as, okay, so that's your voltmeter there, so we're measuring the potential difference between this half cell and this half cell here, okay, so electrons will always flow from a more reactive metal to a less reactive one, okay, and we're going to look at how we can actually identify that as well, um, uh, later we're going to use some um, calculations and some acronyms, um, but effectively that's the rule, okay, so the zinc half cell, this one here, okay, um, this shows the loss of electrons as zinc loses electrons easier than copper. And we're going to look at this a little bit later in the next slide. You might think, well, how do you know that? We'll look at it in a bit more detail later, okay? So just for this purpose, we're just going to assume that that is the case here, okay? So oxidation has occurred in this case. So zinc is going to zinc 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. So what we observe when we set this up is effectively the zinc electrode will start to become thinner. It'll start to deteriorate at the tip here. And this is because zinc is being converted into zinc 2 plus. So effectively it's turning into this and the electrons are then being produced, which will then go through this wire here. So on the other side, there we are. Okay, so there's your electrons. So they move around there. So zinc goes to zinc 2 plus and the electrons start going around the wire and they go on to the copper side here. So effectively copper is receiving the electrons um, so from that was produced from the zinc. So there it is there. So copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons will form copper. So it's the copper 2 plus ions here that receive them electrons that come through and they convert into copper. So what we would observe practically is we get a bit of a buildup of copper around this electrode here because we're getting copper 2 plus being converted into copper. And so therefore the concentration of copper 2 plus will drop but the concentration of zinc plus, zinc 2 plus here will increase. Okay, the salt bridge remember is potassium nitrate. That's the salt bridge in the middle. So that's that saturated solution. Um, and that's we use the uh, filter paper we dip that into that solution okay and note that salt bridge like I say is, is just a filter paper dipped in that solution but its purpose is to allow ions to flow through it and it balances the charges out if we didn't have that salt bridge in that beaker then um, the the cell just simply wouldn't work you can try it if you actually get if you actually manage to have a go at this if you set this away and release your salt bridge take it out you'll see that the voltmeter will drop to zero okay so we're going to look at something called electrode potentials okay so each half cell actually has an electrode potential that has a value this is an e naught value and we measure that in volts okay now it tells us how easily the half cell gives up electrons or is oxidized so this is how we're going to establish what is actually happening in each half cell equation okay so let's bring back in um these two um half cells here so you can see we've noticed that on the previous slide we had two half cells and each half cell has a reversible reaction okay so we've got zinc two plus reacting or plus two electrons will form zinc 
and copper two plus plus two electrons will form copper. Okay, these are just the half cells. Don't worry about what actually what happens in the BK yet. This is just showing you what the half cells are. So in electrochemical cells, we always write these equations in the reduced form. So this means that we always show electrons on the left hand side and um, moving forward. Obviously, these four the uh, moving forward in the forward equation. So you can see we've got zinc two plus always accepting two electrons to form zinc, copper two plus accepting two electrons to form copper. So the list of these, there's a huge list of these, massive list, they're always as standard shown in the reduced form. That doesn't mean in reality they're going to react in this way. It's just a way of representing half cells in these beakers. Okay. So remember, when we connect these two half cells together, we always have one half cell undergoing reduction and one undergoing oxidation. Okay. What we need to be able to do is establish which one is being reduced and which one has been oxidized. And to do that, we need to look at their electrode potential value or E0. And you will have a data book. You'll either have a, a sorry, you'll have a, um, a sheet or be written in your exam. You're not expected to remember the E0 values of these. Okay, so you'll always be given these values. So you can see these are the E0 values of these equations. Okay, this is under standard conditions, of course. Okay, so here we can see that the zinc 2 plus zinc half cell, so this one here, has a negative E0 value. And the copper 2 plus copper half cell has a positive E0 value. So these numbers will be given to you as with the equations, okay? So you don't need to worry about this. All these numbers will be given to you. You need to know what to do with these, okay? So we've got a negative and we've got a positive. Now, you might have, you might have been taught in various different ways in which, how you can work this out. But I'm going to use this way because I try and keep it as simple as I possibly can. That, again, can apply to... Um, the situations that you need to know for a level chemistry okay so i'm going to use this acronym and i want you to try and remember it which is no problem okay so the most negative half cell will undergo oxidation the most positive half cell will undergo reduction so no problem so every time you see this just think no problem okay and it makes it a lot lot easier much much easier rather than trying to remember what's been oxidized what's the oxidizing agent what's the reducing agent remember that acronym and just think okay no problem I'll sort this out okay so no problem negative half cell oxidation um positive half cell will undergo reduction okay so in this case our zinc 2 plus and zinc is the most negative out of these two here so it will be the half cell where oxidation takes place okay so remember from the acronym earlier on oxidation is loss of electrons so um this means that we flip this equation round Okay, so effectively this is showing um, the acceptance of electrons. So here we're going to flip that the other way around. So we're going to have zinc producing zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. Okay, so this is definitely showing the loss of electrons. Okay, so in this cell we have zinc giving up electrons and copper 2 plus ions accepted them. So we combine them two equations just as we've seen before earlier on in the video. We combine the two equations, make sure your electrons balance, and then we get zinc plus copper 2 plus will form zinc 2 plus plus copper. <coughs> okay, so remember that acronym, no problem, okay, because we're going to use it all the way through for the next slides, okay. Right, so you might be thinking, well, how on earth do they actually work out the voltage of each of them half cells, okay? So we use something called a standard hydrogen electrode or a SHE to help us work this out. So the standard hydrogen electrode or SHE is used as a reference to measure the standard electrode potentials. That's your E0 value, okay? So these electrode potentials of these half cells, they can't actually be measured on their own. We've got to use a reference uh, a reference cell to basically measure them against. Okay, it's like anything in in science, you know, to to kind of understand the magnitude of something or to to measure something. We've always got to measure it against something, otherwise you'll never know, you know, in what context that is. So you can talk about things like, for example, um, if I give you an example of is an elephant heavy? Now you think in your head, yes, it is heavy probably um now if i then compare that with something or put some context behind that and say is an elephant heavy compared to the earth and you'll say no actually it's really light so in our minds every day we always when we're 
assessing something or where we're trying to understand something, we're comparing it against something, okay? Because without that context, it's really difficult to actually pass judgment on something. So you can see on with a standard hydrogen electrode, we've got to do this. We've got to use something where we can measure it against, and that will tell us, um, you know, how big is the E0 value for this. So we use um, this um, standard hydrogen electrode and we equate that to zero volts and anything connected to that will then show us the um, you know the E naught or the E value of it the E naught value electrode potential okay so we use this setup here so you can see here we have our standard hydrogen electrode which is here and one of the key things is that um, we have hydrogen going in H2 this is going in at 298 Kelvin 100 kilopascals these are the standard conditions okay so this is going into the side here into this um, glass tube as you can see here and we've got a platinum electrode which is there we also have as you can see there H plus ions so we have one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions that's going in there um, and we also have one mole per dm cubed of copper 2 plus ions as well so this is the standard standard setup so they call it a standard hydrogen electrode hydrogen being well there's your hydrogen going in electrode because this is the electrode setup here we use a platinum electrode um, and standard because we have a standard set of conditions and that allows us to measure the e naught value of this so you can see the word standard is really really important and you must know what the conditions are really important so the conditions are a temperature of 298 kelvin a pressure of 100 kilopascals and the concentrations of ions must be at one moles per decimeters cubed okay so in this diagram you can see um, the she or the standard hydrogen electrode is compared is connected sorry to your copper copper two plus half cell and assuming all them conditions are met so 298 kelvin 100 kilopascals of pressure concentration of one mole per dm cubed of all ions then this should tell us the e naught value for the copper copper two plus half cell so the value in there would tell us the half the value of the half cell for this because we're measuring it against this reference here now just a word of warning um Obviously, we're using an acid here, and we need one mole of H plus ions, not one mole of acid. Okay, so let me show you. So, to get one mole of one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions, we need one mole per dm cubed of HCl, that's fine, or we use half a mole mole per dm cubed of sulfuric acid. So, remember, sulfuric acid is diprotic, it will produce two protons for every molecule of this it will produce two protons. So it's the one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions, not one mole per dm cubed of acid. Just be really, really careful with that. They could trip you up on that. So as long as you're aware of that, then you should be fine. Okay, so just be really kind of, uh, really kind of directional with your language, you know, really precise. Don't be just saying, oh, you need one mole of acid because you won't get that right. Okay, it's one mole of H plus ions. Okay, so... We're then going to look at something called the electrochemical series. Okay, so the we've seen some of the half equations and we've seen the E naught values of each of them as well. So electrochemical series is just a list of half cell reactions and their standard electrode potential. So it's the E naught value. Okay, so just as an example, okay, this is a very very short, um, very very short list, um, but. You know, the list here is absolutely massive, okay? You've got loads, you can have a data book with maybe three or four pages of these with all your different half cell reactions. Remember, all these values here are measured because we connected this half cell to the standard hydrogen electrode. So these are the values here. You will be given these, okay? So you don't need to worry, okay? So note the table shows the e naught values in descending order so we're going from highest to lowest and you may get it the other way around there's no standard for that okay and um, but there is a standard for writing your half cell reactions notice all of these are written in the reduced form that's the standard way in which they're represented okay right so as we go up this table here in this order, okay, you get the stronger oxidizing agent, okay, at the top there. They could ask you to identify the strongest oxidizing agent or the strongest reducing agent in a series like this. So you've got to be you've got to be alert to that. So agents on the left hand side, assuming that the table goes in descending order like this, okay, um, are 
are more easily reduced. So this positive value here is telling you that this reaction is very likely to go in its current form. Okay, that's a positive value. So that's saying chlorine is more than happy to accept two electrons to form two Cl minus. Okay, so that's telling us that's likely to happen. So they have an increase in tendency to gain electrons, as you can see. So they are more powerful oxidizing agents. So this is the most powerful oxidizing agent, which is Cl2. And your weakest oxidizing agent out of this lot is magnesium 2+. plus. This is not so keen to accept these two electrons to form magnesium because the standard electrode potential, or E0, has a negative value. Okay, so let's look at it on the other side. So the stronger reducing agent is going down in this case because the electrode potentials are in descending order. So agents on the right-hand side of the equation um, are more easily oxidized. Okay, so these are the ones which are most easily oxidized, which are these ones here. Okay. So these have a tendency to lose electrons. These are more powerful reducing agents. So this negative value here is telling us actually magnesium is more likely um, to give up these two electrons to form magnesium 2 plus, okay? Which kind of makes sense because it now has a full outer shell of electrons. So that's quite a, a favorable process. So this means because it's more likely to lose electrons, um, then um, there you go. Um, then it's the most powerful oxidizing agent, which is magnesium, and your weakest reducing agent is Cl minus. Okay. So remember, oxidation is loss of electrons, but an oxidizing agent gains electrons. Okay. Reduction is the gain of electrons, but a reducing agent loses electrons. Okay. Don't get the two confused. That's what I said right at the start of the video. Make sure you're understanding the difference between oxidation and an oxidizing agent. Okay. Right. Okay. So we know this electrochemical series. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate some standard cell potentials using this data and the information that we've seen before about what a half cell is. Okay. So standard electrode potentials or E0 can be used to calculate the standard cell potential or E0 of the cell. Okay. And we use this equation here. So E0 of the cell equals E0 reduced minus E0 oxidized. So I remember it, you might think, well, how do you know which way around it is? I just remember it as redox. Okay, so reduced first, then oxidized, and you put a minus in between. So redox, so E0 of the reduced minus E0 of the oxidized. Okay, so remember half cell equations with the most negative value is being oxidized. Okay, so if you have two positives or two negatives, then it's the most negative that is oxidized. To remember that acronym, no problem. So negative, oxidized, positive, reduced. Okay, so let's bring in our electrochemical series. There it is. Okay, so we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to calculate the E0 of the cell when Cl2, Cl minus, so this half cell, and zinc 2 plus and zinc half cells are connected. Okay, so the first thing we have to do as you might think, is we need to work out um, we need to work out what's being reduced and what's being oxidized so we can actually put them in the right order. So you can see here what we're going to look at what's been oxidized. Okay, so your zinc two plus and zinc half cell is the most negative. So this one here is the most negative. So this is the one that has been oxidized. Okay, so remember, no problem. Negative oxidized. Okay, so this is the most negative. So we put our numbers in there. So it's 1.36 volts for the chlorine half cell minus minus 0.76. That's going to give us a positive value of 2.12. That's the E0 of our cell. Let's look at a second example. So we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to calculate the E0 of the cell when a chlorine half cell still reacts with a copper half cell and we connect them together. So again, we need to do exactly the same thing. We need to identify what's been oxidized and reduced. So here, the most negative in this case, we've got copper and we've got chlorine. Both are positive, okay? But this one is more negative. This one's less positive than that one. So this is the one that's been oxidized, okay? So that one's been oxidized. So then we put our values in our uh, equation and we get a value of plus 1.02, okay? Right, so really important, you must be able to work out the E0 of the cell. 
Right, now what we're going to do is we're going to move into predicting reaction feasibility. So we know kind of what, what a half salt is, and we know what the reactions are, we know what's been oxidized and what's been reduced, and we know we can work out the e naught of a cell. So now what we're going to do is pull all that together, okay, and we're going to look at predicting if a reaction is actually going to go. Okay, this is really good stuff, this. Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to look at a few different examples here just to make sure you understand what's going on. So standard electrode potentials, or E0, these can be used to predict if a stated reaction is likely to proceed under standard conditions. Okay, so we're going to look at an example. We're going to bring our E, there you go, we're going to bring our um, electrochemical series back again, the ones that we need there. This would be typical of what you get in an exam. They'd give you like a snapshot like that. So use the data in the electrochemical series to predict whether solid magnesium will react with copper 2 plus ions in solution under standard conditions. Okay, so remember, no problem. Okay, half cell equation with the most negative E0 value is oxidized. So that's no problem. Most negative, oxidized, positive, reduced. Okay, so you have two positives, two negatives. It's the most negative that's oxidized. So the first thing we need to do is identify, just like we'd seen before, which has been oxidized. Um, and so you can see the magnesium 2 plus magnesium half cell has the most negative value. There it is. Okay. That's in connection with the copper one, which is positive. So this is the one that's been oxidized. Okay. So remember what we did with the no problem on the no problem slide is we take that oxidized equation and we flip it round. We reverse it. So anything that's been oxidized, we flip it round and we write the two equations side by side like this. Okay, so we put them one on top of the other. So this is the one that's been oxidized. So we um, uh, we flip it round the other way to show oxidation happening. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. So you can see this equation here is showing electrons being given up, being lost. So this is oxidized and the other one we just keep the same. So that's reduced. So there's our two equations there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to combine these to form a full ionic equation. So remember to balance your electrons. Obviously we've got two and two on each side so they're already balanced. So combine them and this gives us our feasible reaction. Okay this is the only reaction that is going to happen. So then all we have to do is we then look at that equation and we compare it with the um, scenario in the question. And basically what this equation is telling us is that magnesium will react with copper 2 plus to form magnesium 2 plus and copper. So this is the reaction that's going to happen. Okay, this is the only reaction that will happen. So we compare it and it says predict whether solid magnesium will react with copper 2 ions. Well, it will because this is telling us it will. Now, you might not be content on just that as an answer. So um, and the exam board actually may indeed ask you to prove it. So you can see we're going to confirm this by calculating the E0 of the cell and all feasible reactions will have a positive E0 cell value. Okay, so all we do is we bring that equation back in. So we've got reduced 0.34, that's the one that's been reduced. So that's your copper and your oxidized is the magnesium at the bottom there. So that's minus, minus, uh, minus, minus 2.38. So the value is going to be 2.72 volts. Okay, that positive value tells us that it's feasible under these conditions, standard room temperature and pressure. If it's not standard room temperature and pressure, then we don't, it may not be feasible. Um, if the temperature is greatly different, then, you know, it might not work. So it, it, this is only understanding conditions. So just be aware of that, that temperature and pressure can impact, um, you know, the feasibility of reaction. Okay, so let's look at a second example here. So we're going to use the um, data in the electrochemical series to justify why iron nails become rusty when they're in contact with air and moisture. So the word used here is slightly different. We're asking for justification. Okay, so they've told us it does work. We just need to prove it. So the two equations we're going to be using are these two here. Okay, so they haven't actually given us any values. We need to use our brains to work out, right, um, Obviously, the iron nails, we need to look for half equation with iron in there, okay, which there it is, solid iron, okay, and it's um, in contact with air and moisture, okay, which is just in the air anyway. So, the best half equation to use this is this one, because we've got oxygen and we've got water, so you've got your moisture there. So, these are the two half equations that we're going to be using to tackle this question. So, like with the other example, the first thing we've got to do is identify what's being oxidized, 
So Fe2 plus Fe uh, half cell here is the most negative. So this one is the one that's going to be oxidized, this one here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that oxidized one, remember, and flip it round and then write the two equations side by side. So you should get something like this. So you've got your oxidized at the top and your reduced at the bottom there. Okay, so we're just writing all these equations out. Right, so here we multiply the top equation by 2 because you can see here that we've got... Um, uh, we've got two electrons on the top and we've got four electrons on the bottom. So we multiply that top row by two. And then what we need to do is combine the two equations to write an overall equation. So remember, we'd seen this at the start of the video. So we combine them and that gives us our feasible reaction. That's the only one which is feasible, which will work. Now that's fine because they've told us it'll work. We just need to prove it. We need to show it. So you need to state that this is the feasible reaction like we've just done on there. We compare this to the equation and we can see that, and you actually state this as well, you can see that Fe will react with oxygen in the air and moisture, which is the water, to form Fe2 plus and 4OH minus. So this proves Fe2 plus, so it's an iron oxide, and we'll look at this later towards the end of the video about uh, about rust, um, but this is actually what causes the, um, uh, the reaction. Okay, so it's Fe, so iron oxides. So you can see, confirm this by calculating the E0 of the cell. We put all the numbers in as we've just seen before. And if we get a positive E0 cell value or E cell value, um, then it's definitely feasible. So this one is feasible plus 0.84 volts. Okay, so it's just a different spin on it because they're asking us to justify something. Okay, so let's have a look at another example. So this is looking at reaction feasibility three. So the first thing you've got to be really careful of is that just because you actually calculate the E0 value um, and say that it is feasible, it doesn't mean that it will actually go, okay? Just be really careful with this. They'll probably get, they'll walk you down, the, the exam board will probably walk you down, a, a, like a, walk you down a, an alleyway and you'll convince yourself and say, yeah, that is feasible. And then they'll chuck in a question at the end and say, well, tell me why it's not. And it's like, well, hang on, I've just calculated that to be feasible. So just be careful. They're really testing your knowledge here to try and make sure if you understand that, you know, what you what you calculate isn't always feasible. You've got to be able to explain why. This is just the beauty of science, I suppose. OK, there's always a, a bit of a caveat to things. So non-standard conditions. Remember what I said before. If we change the concentration or temperature, it can cause that electrode potential to change. All the figures that we've just seen there assume standard conditions. If we deviate away from any of them, then the E0 value will change. And if it changes to such an extent where the overall value of the cell becomes negative, then it won't work. Okay, so these are these calculations are assuming these standard conditions. So let's take that rusty nail example that we'd seen before. Okay, so there's our two half equations. And remember, we worked out the E0 of the cell to be plus 0.84. So this is telling us that it will go, it should go, it's feasible. But if we increase the concentration of oxygen, okay, which is this bit here, okay, the equilibrium will shift to the right to use it up, okay? So this means it makes it easier, because we're doing this, for oxygen to gain the electrons, Okay, so because we've increased that, there's going to be a, a much higher activity shifting it to the right. And so the electrode potential, this value here, will become more positive. Um, and this, the overall, or that should say cell, not fell potential, um, the cell potential will be higher as a result if this figure is greater. Okay, so that's going to increase that. So that's going to turn to an E0 because <coughs> we've changed the conditions, the reaction conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so if you increase the concentration of iron, which is this bit here, um, equilibrium will shift to the left. This is like Le Chatelier's principle. Less electrons are used up because effectively we're moving it to this side. So there isn't, you know, the equilibrium shifting to the left means that less of these electrons have been used up to make the iron because it's moving to the left. And so this value here becomes less negative um, and the full cell potential um, will be lower as a result because if this number here um, is increasing or becoming more positive um, then obviously we're not going to get um, uh, this value here um, is not going to give us a bigger value so that's not a favorable position to be in 
So you can see here that um, another example as well is the kinetics may not be uh, may not be favourable. So for example, the re rate of reaction, in particular with the rusty nail example, um, it might be really really slow. And on apparent, you may look at it and think, well, nothing's happening. But it might be just the rate is so slow that you can't see anything in in the time frame that you've got. Um, also, if the reaction has a high activation energy, this may stop the reaction happening altogether unless that activation energy is breached. So you might need a catalyst, for example, to help a reaction go. So you've just got to be really, really careful um, with that. And don't necessarily assume that just because something is calculated as feasible, it's not going to be feasible at all temperatures or, you know, um, of the conditions change as you've seen there. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of stick on the rusting theme and Salter's wanting to know a little bit more information about rusting, okay? So we've seen that rusting is a feasible reaction, okay? So we know that it works. We can see it around us. You know, that's obvious. We can see rust, okay? So we know it's feasible. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to see actually how rust is actually formed. How does it actually come about? Because it's a real problem. Okay, it's a real problem. We we construct things um, out of metals that contain, for example, transition metals. We construct things out of iron, and it causes a problem because we build a bridge out of steel. For example, there's a um, a viaduct not far from where I live that goes over the Wandsbeck, and it's a it's a steel viaduct that trains go over. Um, that um, has to be constantly monitored and repaired and painted and and whatever. And we'll look at how we can do this as well because. Rust weakens the structure, the fabric of that, and we don't want the bridge to fall down and the train to fall into the Wandsbeck. Okay, so, um, so let's have a look. So the reminder: remember from this, the previous slides, Fe two plus plus two electrons forms Fe. O2 plus 2H2O plus 4 electrons will form 4H minus. That's all from the previous slide, and we combine them to form this equation. Remember, that was the reaction that we were looking at. Okay. So the Fe2 plus and OH minus, okay, these combine to produce it's these two products here, okay, Fe2 plus and 4OH minus. It's these products here that then combine to form iron 2 hydroxide, so FeOH2, okay. So that's your solid product there. And then this oxidizes or there's a further uh, reaction oxidation of this product feoh2 with more oxygen and more water because that's already in the environment anyway and it produces feoh3 okay which is iron 3 and it's iron 3 that is the rust okay that's what gives it the orangey brownie color okay now over time that iron 3 hydroxide so this here then becomes hydrated and becomes iron 3 hydroxide so you can see here we use this dot xh2o this is water of crystallization so this water is attracted to these iron oxide uh, reactions as you can see and it's the iron oxide that is effectively the rust there so it's not the direct it's not directly made from these it's not it isn't this that's the rust but it's this reaction that starts that process and you can see it goes via three um, or goes via four steps to make the rust and this happens over a long period of time so you can't look at a bit of well you can if you want but it'd be incredibly boring you can't just leave a nail outside and just watch it and see it react it is reacting it is feasible because we see evidence of it it just takes ages to do okay so still on this theme of rusting so rust is less likely to occur if in alkaline conditions okay so we can actually um you know slow down the rate or even prevent rusting and that could be really beneficial particularly as a lot of our structures and buildings are made from um are made from iron based uh, alloys so let's go back to the two half equations that we've seen there okay so we've got fe2 plus um half equation and we've got the oxygen and water half equation there so that was the two that we've seen before now, if we add more hydroxide ions, that's what makes something alkaline. So remember that, okay? From the previous videos, I've done videos on um, acid base, um, acid base equilibria. But so you'll know that OH minus ions. This is the alkaline conditions. Equilibrium in the bottom equation, okay, will shift to the left to remove the extra OH minuses present. So we add an alkaline condition. We add more of this. Le Chatelier's principle says we're going to try and reduce that so equilibrium will shift left to use up the extra OH minus ions that we've produced. So that means that there will be more electrons available because this is breaking down to form these extra electrons which are here. Okay. 
So then as there's more electrons available, the uh, equilibrium in the top equation, this one, will shift to the right and use up them extra electrons because these, remember, are working side by side. They're working in tandem, okay? So these electrons will then shift to the right and that means they'll use up them electrons. Now, what is to the right? Well, it's your iron, okay? So this means that less Fe2 plus ions are actually reacting with these um, electrons, okay? So less Fe2 plus ions, um, sorry, there's less Fe2 plus ions around in general because these are reacting with the extra electrons to form iron, okay? So this means that it's less likely to produce rust as a consequence because it's this reaction forwards, this reaction forwards that allows the rust to be produced. If we can switch that reaction, that first reaction backwards then and produce iron, then we have less, light, less, less likely for rust to occur. So alkaline conditions or treating the, the iron with alkaline conditions um, you know, regularly, that might be in paints, it could be in chemical sprays, um, you know, anything like that can help to reduce the rate at which rusting occurs. Okay, so just on that uh, on that note, actually, we're now going to look at ways in which we, other ways in which we can reduce it as well. Um, so we can use barrier protection to prevent rusting, and we can use sacrificial protection, which um, can also reduce that as well. So let's look at the barrier one first. So Oil and grease also forms a physical uh, a physical barrier. However, particularly useful. Uh, however, this is particularly useful when we're moving parts are involved as well. So we can use, say, like WD-40. I've got a squeaky door downstairs, um, and so I use uh, WD-40 on the hinges, um, and that helps to um, you know helps to allow the the hinge to move more freely. But also, it protects the the hinges from rusting. Um, you know too too much so um, so this is a good idea using this barrier to basically block the oxygen and the water from getting to the, the main fabric of that so you can see here that we've got um, you know steel uh, steel coils there that help or steel wires uh, not wires steel cables that allow us to then um, um, allow us to, to move things or you know in the shipping industry for example mainly um, another way which is kind of a little bit more obvious is painting. Um, so this is a, a nice picture a nice picture of a railing that's been painted. So there's a blue paint uh, and that obviously provides a physical barrier. And, and that's what we see most common, most commonly um, visible is paint. You know, we put it on cars to make them look nice, of course, but also to protect the steel underneath or the, the metal underneath. But also these bollards here, um, you know, it's a, it's a particular um, problem along coastal areas. Um, you know where where you know the sea air and the moisture in the air can really um, you know attack the metal in these uh, in these barriers here. So even more important to keep them painted regularly. Okay, and the final way of um, of protecting um, metals from rusting is sacrificial uh, protection. So this involves actually using a more reactive metal than iron uh, and placing it over the iron, and the water and oxygen will actually react. Um, with that instead of the iron commonly used on ships actually they use um, metal plates on the side of a ship to a sacrificial protection obviously they paint a ship as well but they also add sacrificial protection to stop the ship from rusting too quickly so zinc is normally used um, and we use um, the zinc zinc 2 plus half reaction it has a more negative e naught value compared to iron um, half reaction or the half cell which is Fe, Fe2+, plus, uh, and the zinc will be oxidized to zinc 2 plus ions before the iron. So you can see here, there's our two equations there. The most negative, which is this one, flips the other way around, and if we combine them reactions, then obviously we, we form our um, overall equation, which shows that actually the reaction will react with zinc first, and the iron will be left. So we're using zinc plates to protect the iron underneath. So you can see here in this picture, we can see the barbed wire has been sprayed with zinc. So it's galvanized. So we use that word galvanized steel or galvanized iron. So galvanization is where we're spraying it with a sacrificial chemical on the top. Um, and you can see the post hasn't been um, sprayed with that. So you can see a stark difference there between this rusty post here and this, obviously the barbed wire hasn't been, um, has been sprayed with zinc and it hasn't rusted. So you can see there's a big difference there. 
Okay, so blocks of zinc, like I say, this is what I was saying before, they can be used on ship hulls as well. So we put these big blocks of zinc on there and it just protects the fabric of the ship because you don't want that in the shipyard. You want it to be out in sea as much as possible. You don't want to haul it in out of the sea, put it into a shipyard and then it needs repaired, which is costly. So um, it's better to you know put these zinc, zinc plates on there and when they start to get worn down, you then just put a new zinc plate on. It's easier than repairing it because you don't want a, sink, uh, a, ship, a ship sinking at sea do you uh, right that is it so that's everything you need to know for redox like i said there's two videos for the developing metals topic so the dm topic um so um that covers the full topic the two videos between them um there is a full range of these videos for year one and year two for salters all dedicated and tailored to this specification there's also general whiteboard videos whiteboard tutorials as well going through generic information um um, they're all for free like i say all i ask is you please hit the subscribe button that'll be absolutely fantastic just to show you support and get all the updates and i'll keep making them as long as people are subscribing and watching and liking them etc so that'll be absolutely fantastic and also if you want a copy of these they are available to purchase great value for money you can get the full range for your revision notes click on the link below um, and you'll be able to get a hold of them there um but um that's it bye bye